Good afternoon, and welcome to the PRISM eSymposium. I am Leslie Porter Cabell, and I'll be serving as moderator for this session. Derek Sokolowski is my co moderator. Hello, everyone. It's Derek here. You are on the Toxicology Current Session from 5 35 p.m. to 6 p.m. In this session, we will hear from students presenting on topics related to toxicology. If you have questions, please use the Q&A button below to write them and send them to the host. The host will select questions at the end of each presentation. Next slide, please. Our first presenter is Samantha Nolan. The title of the presentation, Fast Screening Method for Drug-Facilitated Sexual Assault Drugs by Direct Mass Spectrometric Analysis of Dried Urine Spots. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Next slide, please. Today, I will be talking about the screening method I developed to identify drug-facilitated sexual assault drugs by the direct analysis of dried urine spots by thin layer chromatography mass spectrometry. I will provide some background on drug-facilitated on drug sexual assaults and dried matrix spots, and then I will go into detail about my research project and how the method was developed. Next. Over 400,000 sexual assaults occur every year in the United States. Frequently, a victim is administered a drug to incapacitate them and prevent them from consenting. Around 11% of women experience drug-facilitated sexual assaults in their lifetime. Common drugs that are utilized in drug-facilitated sexual assaults include benzodiazepines, antidepressants, antihistamines, hallucinogens, opioids, and muscle relaxants. Due to how frequently sexual assaults take place, it is important that there are analytical methods that can be used to identify these drugs employed in these sexual assaults. Next. Current toxicology labs frequently screen for drugs using immunoassays like ELISA or EMIT. These methods are fast and efficient, but are only capable of screening for drug classes and not individual compounds, and they lack the specificity and sensitivity required for drug-facilitated sexual assault cases. Next. In recent years, analytical methods using dried matrix spots have become increasingly developed. Dried matrix spots have a low biohazard risk and are easy to store, thus eliminating storage constraints in laboratories. In dried matrix spot analysis, a specimen is dispensed on a dried matrix spot card and dried. The dried matrix spot can then be analyzed. Current research has utilized LCMSMS, LCMS, and TLCMS as suitable instruments to analyze dried matrix spots. Frequently, methods that utilize dried matrix spots require a lengthy extraction step prior to analysis, making it less time efficient than other screening methods currently used. Next. The purpose of this research was to develop a screening method to identify common drug-facilitated sexual assault drugs by the direct analysis of dried urine spots. The method developed in this research utilized the Advion Plate Express coupled to the Advion Expression Compact Mass Spectrometer. The Advion Plate Express is a thin layer chromatography plate reader that allows for a direct way to obtain mass spectra from TLC plates or dried matrix spots. The Advion Plate Express contains an elution head that lowers onto the spot of interest and extracts the sample, sending it to the mass spectrometer. Next. The drugs that were used in this method were valproic acid, pregabalin, GHB, carisipridol, mepropamate, topiramate, and gabapentin. First, the drugs were optimized to determine the ion master charge ratios that correspond to each compound, as well as determine the instrument parameters that work best for each drug. This was done by directly injecting drug standards diluted in methanol into the mass spectrometer by flow injection analysis. After optimizing the drugs by direct injection, the methanol standards were optimized on the dried matrix spot cards. This allowed me to explore the parameters of the plate, expre plate express instrument. After optimization, the cutoff for each drug was determined. The cutoff is the lowest concentration at which the drug can be detected by the instrument. The cutoff of the drug in methanol and dried matrix spots was determined by analyzing different concentrations of drugs and analyzing the ion peak area and intensity of the peaks produced. After the cutoff of each drug in methanol was determined, the cutoff of the drugs in authentic urine samples was determined. 10 authentic urine samples were fortified at different concentrations and analyzed to determine the cutoff of each drug. Next. As shown in the table, the optimized instrument parameters are shown. As you can see in the table, the first four drugs were analyzed in positive ion mode with the same mobile phase. The following three drugs were analyzed in negative mode with the same mobile phase. The master charge ions for each drug can be seen at the bottom of the table. Next. This graph shows the cutoff for the drugs in methanol as well as the cutoff for the drugs in fortified urine samples. The cutoffs ranged from 0.025 microgram per milliliter to one microgram per milliliter. The cutoffs were the same in methanol and urine for GHB, mepropamate, valproic acid, topiramate, and pregabalin. The cutoffs in urine were less sensitive 
for paraciprodol and gabapentin. Next. In my research, a fast screening method for drug facilitated sexual assault drugs using dried urine spots was successfully developed using a thin layer chromatography mass spectrometer instrument, providing a fast, efficient, and sensitive method to screen for individual drug facilitated sexual assault drugs that saves time and reduces storage constraints and toxicology labs. Next. I would like to thank the PRISM program and all the members of my lab for helping me throughout my project. Thank you, Samantha. You have a question. What advantage do urine samples have over other types of matrices tested in forensic cases? Uh, urine samples are easy to obtain and they don't require you to use like a needle or anything to get them. And there's also a longer uh, detection time in urine for most drugs. Thank you, Samantha. Our next presenter is Andrew Candia. The title of the presentation, Examination of Mercury and Multiple Cat Food Brands in Correlation to Retail Price. Thank you, Andrew. So thank you. Uh, next slide. So hi, everyone. Uh, so to get right into it, I don't think anyone would argue that cats aren't cute. So in enter these cute kitties. They're both here to give us a fluffy feeling, but also pose a serious question. What do we do to better care for these adorable creatures? It's an important question because one possible danger that pet food owners may not consider is cat food. And now you're wondering why cat food? Next slide. Mm -hmm. The answer is mercury. You see, many cat food brands have fish as their primary ingredient. One important characteristic of mercury is mm -hmm. its ability to cycle throughout many parts of the environment, like you see in this photo. Mercury can bioaccumulate up the food chain so it enters the ocean, goes from smaller to bigger fish, and then into the cat food, and we now encounter mercury levels inside cat food. Next slide. So the first step will involve quantification of these mercury levels. All samples will be evaluated in triplicate with appropriate controls. What you see here is the flow of my sample treatment. They are digested in some nitric acid, placed inside bombshells, and enter a microwave. They are then heated and follow a subsequent cool-down period. Next slide. So during the cool down time, a calibration curve is made that will quantify the sample. Calibration standards were ran under the TechRan 2600, the image shown to the right, that undergoes cold vapor atomic fluorescent spectroscopy. The TechRan produces readout peak areas that have a corresponding concentration, which allow me to create the calibration curve like the one shown below. After cool down, the samples are treated with certain reagents to convert all sample mercury into elemental mercury. We then enter the TechRan 2600 and produce peak values that can determine the cat food mercury concentration. Next slide. So for results, approximately low standard deviation and high spike percent recoveries indicate accurate data. In total, 15 brands were tested. They were organized in ascending order, so it is noticeable as to which brands contained higher amounts of mercury. The point then comes if a statistical relationship exists within concentration and price. Next slide. Uh, average cat food prices were plotted against their average mercury concentration. At a glance of the plot, it is evident that a possible relationship may exist since an overwhelming majority of cat foods that are on the low end of mercury concentration are cheaper and the more expensive brands have higher concentrations. It also somewhat fits into the trend line, but I recognize that there is still uncertainty and variation. Next slide. So now it came down to what if mercury concentration is directly related to retail price. The chart seen here shows in ascending order the mercury concentrations of each cat food brand and their list of ingredients. The relevance? Recall that mercury goes up when moving up the food chain. This then should answer why some brands have more mercury, because they use larger types of fish. Similarly, some brands may use more fish ingredients than others, so this adds up more mercury. And some also have fish as a higher order ingredient. So for example, those listed as one indicate that this fish appears as the first ingredient. But one thing I have not really talked about yet is why we should bother. Next slide. So remember I mentioned how all the cats can face the danger of mercury exposure. But what is this danger? Remember that mercury is also a toxic element and a big case that exemplified its toxicity is during the Minamata incident. In the 1950s, a Japanese company uh, began to dump chemical waste into the bay. However, the locals and animals depended heavily on the bay for their food. Eventually, health complications began to show up, and the first cases were mad dancing cats. In summation, the cats ate the mercury fish, began to dance wildly, and would just eventually die. I wanted to, however, stress that Minamata did have abnormal levels in mercury concentrations. For clarity, the prior data of mercury concentrations is shown again, but with two new labels. The top line at 8 ppm is the average mercury levels in Minamata fish. 
The big problem is that you would think cases like Minamata would help create guidelines in pet foods to protect our beloved feline companions. In reality, neither the FDA nor the EPA have set any guidelines as to how Murphy should be in fish for any pet food. For more visualization, sea otter guidelines were used as indicated by the second line. The simple point is that my data is nowhere as near as dangerous as Minamata, but should not be overlooked. Next slide. So in conclusion, I wanted to not only add more research to the scarce field of mercury and pet food, but to bring awareness to consumers who should know of the possible risk of buying more expensive food and push harder for these guidelines. However, this project is ongoing, so I hope to add more brands in the data, potentially add new forms of cat food like canned foods and treats, learn more about what the type of fish plays within all this experimentation and see if a statistical relationship exists. Next slide. Mm -hmm. I would just like to thank the PRISM staff for their mentorship and continuous support, as well as all past and current members of the CARP lab for their support as well. And that's it. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, you have a question. How did you select the standards? Uh, the standards were selected based on like the amount of accuracy and repeated trials. So for example, the specific standards that um, we used were peach leaves as they were um, NIST standardized and they, we, they had a known market concentrations that we were able to work with as well as other specific standards that had a measurable amount of mercury. Thank you, Andrew. Our next presenter is Stephen Taller. The title of the presentation, Development and Application of an Analytical Method for the Determination of MDPV and Metabolites in Rat Brain. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. In this presentation, I'll be discussing the synthetic cathinones class of stimulant drugs, more specifically the drug known as MDPV, and I'll explain the method we created for the detection of MDPV. Finally, I'll explain why our findings are of importance to the fields of forensic toxicology, pharmacology, and the medical sciences in general. Next slide, please. So one increasingly prevalent class of novel drugs are known as synthetic cathinones, or less formally as bath salts. Synthetic cathinones are widely used stimulants similar to cocaine and MDMA. These drugs were first noticed in the early 2010s and their popularity and abuse has grown dramatically across the US and worldwide. One of the most popular drugs from this class is known as MDPV or 3,4-methylene-dioxypyrobalerone. MDPV is a stimulant known to be around 50 times more potent than cocaine with its use leading to symptoms such as psychosis, hallucinations, heart problems, and even death. However, limited, limited pharmacological data is available on how MDPV actually works and how to quantify the drug in the body. In order to gather this data, we must also be able to detect the drug in various matrices of interest, including blood, urine, and brain tissue. This leads us to the concepts of pharmacodynamics, which is the effect a drug has on the body, and pharmacokinetics, which is the effect the body has on the drug. These concepts should be understood for all compounds relevant to pharmacology, medicine, and post-mortem investigations, including illicit substances. However, this becomes both harder yet even more important in the era of designer drugs in which new psychoactive substances are being popularized at an alarming rate. Next slide, please. So overall, our objective is to develop and validate a liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry method for the detection of MDPV and its metabolites in rat brain samples. The main metabolites identified in previous studies are known as catechol and methylcatechol. Next slide, please. Our sample preparation starts by taking 50 milligrams of rat brain tissue and homogenizing the brain in a buffer. The homogenate is then hydrolyzed by beta-glucuronidase enzymes in order to cleave any possible glucuronide conjugates produced by the body in the metabolism of MDPV. The hydrolyzed samples are then put through a supported liquid extraction, or an SLE, in order to remove any remaining biological material left in the samples, such as residual tissues, cells, or proteins. The addition of Ammonium hydroxide adjusts the pH of the sample to create favorable conditions for the cleaning of the sample of biological material. The samples are eluded from the SLE tubes using ethyl acetate, which is then evaporated off. The samples are reconstituted using a solution of 0.1% formic acid in water, which will be utilized in the analysis of the sample for MDPV and its metabolites by liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. This analysis allows us to quantify our compounds of interest by each compound's individual properties, yielding results with high specificity. Next slide, please. Our method was subjected to a rigorous validation process corresponding with the guidelines put forth by the Scientific Working Group for Forensic Toxicology, or SWIGTOX, which are universal standard practices for ensuring that a detection method is accurate and practical. Our method complied with the guidelines, displaying a linearity of five to 1,000 nanograms per gram, low imprecision and bias, slight ion suppression for two of the analytes, 
and limited interferences overall. Next slide, please. We then applied our validated method. We received 64 authentic rat brain specimens to analyze for the presence of MDPV. The rats were dosed with either one, two, or four milligrams per kilogram of MDPV, and the brain samples were collected either 40 or 240 minutes after injection. Next slide, please. After collection, the brain samples were subjected to our method in order to build a time course for the metabolism of MDPV at different doses. From this data, we see that there are high concentrations of MDPV, or the parent compound, and low concentrations of the metabolites, suggesting that the metabolites may not cross the blood-brain barrier as readily. As of now, we are currently gathering pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic data presented via the method, along with neurotransmitter data in order to further develop the pharmacological profile of MDPV. Next slide, please. Overall, our method is sensitive, requiring only 50 milligrams of brain tissue and achieving a limit of detection of five nanograms per gram and a limit of quantification of one nanogram per gram. The sample volume and sensitivities are exceptional compared to previous synthetic cathinone detection methods in brain. The protocol is fast and simple due to the use of the supported liquid extraction and other factors, including the simple homogenization via the bead mill homogenizer. Finally, our method is accurate as it complied with SWIG tox guidelines and utilized liquid chromatography, tandem mass spectrometry analysis, identifying the analytes with a high degree of confidence. Next slide, please. So overall, I would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Michael Bowman from the uh, National Institute on Drug Abuse for performing animal dosing and sample collection. And that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. You have a question. What does glucuronides do to the brain tissues? So glucuronides are um, the conjugates for us. So basically, uh, glucuronidase enzymes are um, enzymes that break down uh, various compounds, um, you know, when we're talking about pharmacology, uh, they break down the drugs that we uh, intake and they convert it into something that the body can get rid of, can excrete through the urine, through the feces, things like that. So uh, glucuronidase enzymes actually breaks up uh, the glucuronide conjugates produced by the enzymes in the body in order to get the free drug so we can quantify it. Thank you, Stephen. Our next presenter is Magdalena Kuchek. The presentation, A Fast and Simple Method for Determination of ETG in Urine by LCMSMS as a Measure of Alcohol Exposure. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you. Next slide, please. My project was to develop and validate a fast and simple method for the determination of ETG metabolites in urine by liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. When an individual consumes alcohol, a vast majority of it is excreted by an oxidative metabolism, as we can see on the left side of the diagram. The most minor pathway of excretion leads to the production of ETG. Because so little of this analyte is produced and it persists for so long, it was vital that the method be of utmost sensitivity for detection. Next, please. Beta-6-ethylglucuronide, or ETG, is our chosen analyte of interest in urine and increases the window of detection for alcohol in comparison to breathalyzer or blood tests. As seen in the chart, this matrix provides the advantage of detecting alcohol consumption for up to an entire weekend, previously not possible with conservative methods. Next, please. The method was created so that it can be applied to test Navy samples for alcohol exposure over a weekend. This profession is known to have a high rate of alcohol abuse and a separate study was developed to find the best methods of intervention. In order to apply this method to authentic cases, we first want it to be easy, quick, and sensitive for the determination of ETG in urine. Next, please. In order for the instrument to detect the metabolite and its concentration, calibrators were prepared from 0.05 to 10 micrograms per milliliter in urine, as well as a negative control. The same curve was prepared with water in place of urine to ensure that the samples were prepared with sufficient solution volumes and matrix effects were not responsible for enhancement or suppression of peaks. Calibrators serve as an indicator of what known concentrations behave like to use an unknown sample's behavior to, to determine its concentration. Each calibrator contained internal standard as a control, blank urine to replicate the authentic sample matrix, standard to produce a concentration and water to dilute the matrix and improve analyte detection. 200 microliters of sample were transferred to Thomson PES filter vials, which filter unwanted particles in urine, eliminating a long extraction step. Next, please. 10 microliters were injected into the LCMS, which was operated in negative multiple reaction monitoring mode, 
using the precursor of a mass to charge ratio of 221 and two product ions of 85 and 75 for ETG, as well as a precursor with two product ions for the internal standard D5 ETG. A gradient elution was used of aqueous 0.1% formic acid in acetyl nitrile in which the organic solvent in the flow of the instrument varies in concentration to help retain all the desired analyte in the hypercarb C18 column. Next, please. Those product ions are a result of ionization and fragmentation steps in the instrument that are specific to the molecule whose signal produces peaks that can be measured and plotted against their known concentration to determine where a sample with a known peak area on the y-axis and unknown concentration on the x-axis would lie. Next, please. The goal of validation is to observe consistent peak areas for given concentrations before applying this method to authentic samples. The curves were ran for six days. They were in the same ranges, were linear when graphed by the software peak areas, and calibrators behaved the same within runs while replicating our matrix of urine. Matrix effects results were conducted by comparing ETG extraction in water to extraction in urine, and the negative value indicates that the instrument sensitivity is diminished when urine is used, but still in an acceptable range so that it does not cause much deviation among samples. The imprecision and bias were also found to be under 20%. Because the deviation is within a 20% range, it is found acceptable by the scientific working group for forensic toxicology. Next, please. Two authentic samples were ran with the method to show that the method was fast and allowed for the quantitation of the concentration of ETG in urine so that we know the individuals had consumed alcohol over the past few days. The method can be further used to monitor rehabilitation patients for alcohol abuse and further research in psychology for alcohol addiction. Next, please. I would like to thank Dr. Martha Conchero Gisan and John Jay College's Forensic Science Toxicology Laboratory for making this possible. Thank you, Magdalena. You have a question. How much alcohol has to be consumed to be positive in urine ETG? Very little. Um, studies in literature showed positives in urine for ETG after the consumption of just non-alcoholic beer uh, and even after using mouthwash with alcohol. Wow. Thank you, Magdalena. With that, we conclude our session. I would like to take, thank presenters for their work and ask everyone in our audience to send them a big round of applause. Please join us in our second plenary session to hear Dr. Livia Orta, John Jay alumni and keynote speaker. Visit www.jjay.cuny.edu slash prism and locate the link to the plenary session. Register and join the room. Thank you and see you there.